The next filmmaker to take up the mantle was Shinya Tsukamoto. Unlike Ishii and Izumiya, who came to filmmaking through music, Tsukamoto's background was in experimental theater. A precocious child, Tsukamoto spent many of his teenage years making 8mm films with friends and family, but his strict father forced him to find a day job when he reached adulthood. Tsukamoto started working at an advertising company while forming his own theater troupe on the side, which he dubbed Kaiju Theater. Remarkably, Tsukamoto's first serious jabs at professional filmmaking all originated from his theater productions. When he quit advertising to focus on his first feature, Tetsuo the Iron Man, his father basically disowned him, and the following months were a grueling endurance test as Tsukamoto struggled to finish the film almost single-handedly. Working from his admiration for the films of David Cronenberg, in particular Videodrome and The Fly, as well as a childhood fixation on sci-fi and monster movies, Tsukamoto poured out all his frustrations with modern Japan. The central character, known only as the Salaryman, is the conservative Japanese everyman whose dark secrets and forbidden desires take on physical form when his body inexplicably begins to morph into metal. Again, the art lies not in the story, but in the telling. Tsukamoto's film, in true Japanese cyberpunk fashion, is meant to be experienced through sight and sound, not explained through language. Our hero, the salaryman, can no more comprehend his situation than we can. Events connect and flow elliptically like a nightmare, and pent-up feelings of fear and rage burst out in inarticulate chaos. Tsukamoto shows us modern city life through the eyes of a collapsing mind, a world no longer safe, no longer making sense. Tsukamoto wrote, directed, edited, shot, designed, and acted in the film himself. It is a mind-boggling technical achievement. The dizzying camera work and supersonic editing feel somewhat indebted to Sogo Ishii, but Tsukamoto infuses the film entirely with his own sensibility. There are incredible sequences utilizing a kind of stop-motion technique that allows camera and actors to move at impossible speeds, and scenes of bodily mutation are inventive and graphic. The post-human concerns Tsukamoto voices, implying that his salaryman's deformed cybernetic body may be an accelerated evolutionary process, could owe as much to Izumiya as they do to Cronenberg. They are concerns common to all cyberpunk works, going back to Blade Runner in 1982, arguably reaching as far back in cinematic history as Fritz Long's 1927 masterpiece, Metropolis, a film Izumiya allegedly used as inspiration on death powder. If science fiction is a way of speculating on the future of human society, cyberpunk might be described as a way of speculating on the future of humanity itself. Human beings evolve with civilization. Now that machines and technology have become so prevalent, almost extensions of our collective mind, and as the consequences of that omnipresence become visible, how much might humanity be altering its own evolution? Is the human being of tomorrow organic, robotic, or some incomprehensible hybrid of both? These questions aren't necessarily foreboding of doom, but for the cyberpunk directors, they are a source of deep anxiety. Shozen Fukui wanted to see how far those questions could be pushed cinematically. The third musician filmmaker to find his way to the movement, Fukui had worked on the crew for Tetsuo the Iron Man, and afterwards determined to make a feature himself. Recruiting members of his own band and shooting guerrilla style in the streets of Tokyo, Fukui unleashed 
964 Pinocchio, an experience extreme even by the standards of Japanese cyberpunk. The film opens with a lobotomized sex cyborg being abandoned in the middle of Tokyo. Stumbling mindlessly, he happens upon a mysterious woman whose memory has been wiped. In their short time together, fragments of their identities begin to return, and the unfathomable traumas lurking in their pasts cause a mental break so severe that their minds and bodies begin mutating. There are sequences of such jaw-dropping insanity here that they must be seen to be believed. Fukui's work has been described as resembling the home movies of a psychopath, and that's not far off the mark. Some of his directorial choices do border on lunacy. Fukui favors longer takes compared to his contemporaries in the cyberpunk movement, and urges his actors into performances of such over-the-top intensity, most viewers will probably not be able to handle it. There is likely more shouting and more puking in 964 Pinocchio than has ever been put on screen in a single film ever. Digging a little deeper into Fukui's motivations, his methods make a little more sense. He cites as two of his favorite films Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Andrei Zulavsky's Possession, both infamous for their relentless excess. Fukui's intent was obviously not to tell a rational story. As he has explained, the ultimate goal in Pinocchio was to attain a zen-like state of nothingness. By exhausting cast, crew, and audience with a fever pitch of emotion, a non-stop frenzy of visceral bombardment, he hoped to empty their minds of all material concerns, clearing the space for an entrance of transcendent ecstasy. In other words, Fukui was hoping to achieve in reality, in the viewer, a version of the amplified mental space previous cyberpunk films portrayed fictionally. As taxing as that experience is, it's also unforgettable, if you can stomach it. 964 Pinocchio may be the most audacious and the most polarizing effort in the whole movement. For other genres, this probably would have announced an arrival. For this one, it was an abrupt collision with the terminal limits.